So, last time we began to look at the Antichrist as part of our larger study on eschatology, looking at the way that I think things are going to unfold in the last days. So, we did an introduction in, uh, on who this person of Antichrist is, and uh, I mentioned that that was kind of setting the stage for a look into Daniel chapter 7, where we get a, uh, uh, a more in-depth look at his background, sort of... Uh, some of the elements that he's going to be involved in, and all those kinds of things. So as we uh, prepare to go ahead and take a look into Daniel chapter 7, of course we want to begin by opening up to Revelation 13. So why don't you open up your Bible to Revelation chapter 13. Uh, for those of you who have been following our Revelation study on Sunday mornings, when we were in Revelation 13, uh, we talked about this very thing too. And so um, uh, some of this may sound like review to uh, those who have, have listened to that. And of course, if you haven't listened to that and you want to, you can as well. But in Revelation chapter 13, we come to the portion of the book that now begins to focus very specifically on this, uh, this one who is called the beast. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, verses 1 through 10 in Revelation chapter 13. There are actually two beasts in view in, in, in the entire chapter, but we're for starters going to really just focus on the first of the two. And so uh, Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Then I, John that is, stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns were ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. And so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months, or three and a half years. Uh, then he opened, or time, times, and a half a time as it's variously uh, referred to. But this would be the Great Tribulation period. This would now speak to the last three and a half years of what is known as Daniel's 70th week. Uh, we've talked about it in the past in previous episodes in various contexts. We will cover that again in a coming episode as well. But the 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name as tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the authority uh, and authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now it's interesting, that phrase, tribe, tongue, and nation, appears earlier in chapter um, 5 of the book of Revelation where it talks about um, this worship uh, uh, gathering around the throne and that people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And, uh, and so in, in that setting, it's referring to those who are redeemed uh, from the earth, who are standing before the throne of God. Here, it seems to be referring to those who are on the earth uh, during this uh, period of time in the Great Tribulation. Um, so, but he is blaspheming those in heaven, so it could be referring, these could be connected with those, but uh, certainly if he's blaspheming those in heaven, this would include those who are worshiping around the throne. But this phrase seems to refer to basically the population of the earth in that. And so um, in verse 7 again, it's granted for him to make uh, war, not again, but verse 7, it's granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given to him, again, over every tri uh, tribe, tongue, and nation. That's what it was. I wanted to also point out that you'll notice here that he is given authority over over uh, uh, those who, uh, um, uh, or I'm saying he's able to make war with the saints and overcome them. The idea of making war with the saints and overcoming them is something that troubles uh, uh, some Bible students because Jesus spoke about uh, his church and how the gates of hell would not uh, um, you know, prevail against it and those kinds of things. Um, typically, the term saint is referred, uh, refers to those who are believers in, in, uh, in the New Testament context. The thought of Satan or Satan through the Antichrist having power to overcome them is something that troubles, um, that troubles some Bible students. But it's important to remember a couple of things. Um, in one sense, no saint is ever fully overcome because we ultimately have victory in Christ, and so that's a very real thing to consider. Uh, the other thing, in terms of those who are being referred to in the passage here, we are in the Great Tribulation period, which means the wrath of God, wherever you stand on the wrath of God coming, by this point, 
um, we're we're in a point that is pretty much right there in 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 the indisputable period of time known as the the wrath of God. Well, Paul tells us uh, twice in uh, in First Thessalonians that we are not appointed to such things, not appointed to wrath. And the reason for this is because Christ has taken our wrath upon himself. Some of the judgment that they are feeling here on the earth, or the judgment, I should say, that they're feeling on the earth during that time is part of the wrath that ultimately is unfolded when they are finally judged, but it is even being experienced during this time. It is called the wrath of God uh, that is falling upon them. And so those saints who are around at that time are experiencing a period of time where the Antichrist... Uh, and Satan through the Antichrist, has a tremendous amount of reach and and authority. Uh, Many of the saints during that period of time are killed by the Antichrist. Uh, And so this would would speak of all of those who have come to faith at some point during this seven-year period of time called Daniel's 70th week. And, um, And they are those who remain after the rapture of the church, which I think is another key point to remember is that, uh, at least from my perspective, as, a, as one who holds a pre-tribulation view of the, of the rapture, the church has been gone prior to the seventh, uh, 70th week of Daniel. And so these who remain are those who came to faith after that period of time. And so these are those whom the Antichrist is having authority over. Again, it's a, even, even when it says he has victory over them, or he prevails over them, it's important to remember that in terms of him having victory over them, if, if he kills them, that's not really winning per se, because a saint who dies goes to be with the Lord. And so it's kind of a shallow victory in a sense. It's just that in terms of his conquest uh, and his bringing together of the, of the global community to stand against Christ when he returns, um, he has authority to put down those who are in resistance to him. Uh, that would include all of those who refuse to take the mark of the beast and such, which is spoken of later in chapter 13 of Revelation. So um, anyway, just a brief parenthetical there as we make our way through the passage. Uh, verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the earth uh, or of the world. And if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith. Of the saints, so uh, we are introduced now to uh, in the first few verses of chapter thirteen this person called the beast. Now we know him by another title most often. We typically refer to this one as Antichrist, who is not somebody who is an equal to Christ in some way. He is the opposite and in some way equal. No, he's one who is a counterfeit, somebody who sits in the place of in the minds of many. He's not actually a savior of the world, but the world will see him as a savior. As a matter of fact, uh, when we go into the study on Daniel's 70th week, in verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9, the passage that encapsulates this idea of uh, the, the 70 weeks, uh, one of the, verse 27 speaks about the idea how this one will sign a covenant with Israel, uh, essentially fulfilling what Jesus warned about in John chapter 5, verse 43, which we quoted, quoted last time. Uh, where Jesus talks about, to the Pharisees, he says, I come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me, but one will come in his own name, and him you will receive, referring uh, uh, at least in part, if not entirely, of, of Antichrist. And so um, so this is what's going on when the Antichrist comes on the scene. Now, to this point, um, there, there, when, it, when we look at the book of Revelation, and we've mentioned this a number of times as we make our way through the book of Revelation, that the way John is recording these events would lead us to believe that everything we see in there is happening exactly as it's laid out. The problem John has in recording these things is that in heaven, as he sees this vision, as he's caught up to see this vision of the day of the Lord, he is seeing potentially lots of things unfolding, in some cases simultaneously, uh, or things are inserted at particular points, but as he's writing them out, Uh, He has the unenviable task of trying to record it in a way that can be understood by people that that live in in a linear moving time and space. And so um, when we look at uh, chapter 13 and the rise of Antichrist, Antichrist actually rises at the beginning of the 70th week. That's what starts the 70th week, is that the, the, the person who is referred to here as the beast, or otherwise known as Antichrist, is the one who in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, signs a covenant with Israel that they agree to. They, they sign a covenant together, and that marks the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. When we go through that study, we'll explain that in greater detail, but that's what's going on there. And so when we look at 
um, um, in, in our case, the beginning of the, uh, let me say, let me put this a better way. I don't want to start confusing terms. In the book of Revelation, to kind of round out what we're talking about this 70th week, the 70th week of Daniel, as seen from the book of Revelation, begins with the opening of the first seal in chapter 6. This is where the Antichrist goes forth conquering and to conquer. He's a rider on a white horse. He's got a bow, but no arrows, interestingly. Um, and some people mistakenly think this is a picture of Jesus Christ, but it's not. It's actually a picture of Antichrist, who goes forth to conquer. The implication seems to be that when he goes forth with the bow and no arrows is that he goes forth to conquer, but it is in somewhat of a peaceful fashion. In other words, uh, he goes to take over, but he does so in a way that is not necessarily violent, at least at first. Later on, violence does enter in. Uh, but in the beginning, as he goes forth, that marks the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. Chapter 13 uh, finds itself situated at the midway point of the 70th week of Daniel, in concert with chapter 12, where the persecution of Israel happens, the Antichrist rises to power in chapter 13, ultimately blended together with this idea of persecuting Israel that is described in chapter 12. Um, but this is what's happening in this period of time. So it's not as though the Antichrist just rises to power now. What's actually in view is that the Antichrist is sort of now on the scene as he is as Antichrist. Previously, he's been some kind of a global leader that has been really impressing people with what he's been able to do, bringing peace with Israel. Uh, I would imagine it has to do with bringing peace to the Middle East when he signs this covenant with Israel. Um, without getting too far off on a tangent, uh, the presumption tends to be that when he signs that covenant with Israel uh, at the beginning of the 70th week, according to Daniel 9.27, likely in view in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation with this first seal being broken, uh, the first rider. Um, along with that, signing of that peace covenant, probably also included in that is the ability of Israel to rebuild their, their third temple or to build their third temple so they can once again begin sacrifices and offerings. Part of the reason we know that sacrifices and offerings happen again is because in the middle of that seven-year peace covenant, Antichrist goes into the temple and declares himself to be God and he violates that covenant and causes the offerings and sacrifices to cease. Uh, that is according to, again, Daniel. Paul speaks of this episode in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as well. So, uh, by the way, all these references are going to be uh, in the notes here in the episode. So, but that's kind of a, an attempt to round out the picture a little bit of what's happening here as we look at verse or chapter 13. Now, the description uh, that is given of this beast in chapter 13 is a kind of bizarre one. Again, look at it here from a moment. He rises up from the sea. He's got seven heads and ten horns, uh, and on his horn ten crowns. And the beast he saw was like a leopard, like a bear, like a lion, and in various ways as described here in verse 2. And ultimately, it is the dragon or Satan who is behind him, giving him power and authority to accomplish that which he's going to accomplish. But the description, these various wild animals and these heads with, with horns and all this kind of thing, to somebody who is sort of just approaching these things for the first time or, or who has never really looked into it, we have to admit this is a bizarre description. What, what on earth does that mean? This is one of the reasons why when people approach the book of Revelation, they tend to do so with it being seen as a symbolic kind of a thing. Um, uh, and, and they tend to view the book of Revelation as being symbolic uh, throughout because of that. Clearly, this is in, intended to uh, be symbolic. He doesn't actually look like a bear, a lion, and a leopard, and all this kind of thing. But there are, er there are elements of this description that are intended to be understood a certain way. And that certain way is, uh, is, is understood when we go to Daniel chapter 7. So let's do that. Let's go now to Daniel chapter 7, where we will see a similar description. Now, I'm not going to read all of Daniel chapter 7. Uh, it, it is something you should read all the way through. But uh, again, for time, we're going to go ahead and, and make it a point to point out a number of things that tie together Revelation 13 and Daniel chapter 7. The reason I do this is to point out the fact that Antichrist is not just a concept that appears in the New Testament. We see the terminology Antichrist and such in the New Testament. 
But this person who will fulfill that role is somebody who is spoken of elsewhere in Scripture, not the least of which, again, is uh, Daniel chapter 7. So uh, you'll notice here in Daniel chapter 7, it starts by saying that in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. And then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. I watched until its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and uh, they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. And after this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking into pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts, or all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I was considering the horns when another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and the mouth speaking pompous words. Now, a lot of what we just read should sound awfully familiar from what we just read a moment ago in Revelation chapter 13. We have these same beasts, although in opposite order, uh, labeled, mentioned, and with virtually the same description. A little bit more description in Daniel, but we have clearly a connection between what John sees in the book of Revelation and what Daniel sees in his vision here recorded in Daniel chapter 7. These are very important things for us to understand because it tells us, um, along with the idea that Daniel is told that his vision are for things pertaining to the end, this ultimately then finds its realization in the vision that John sees Maybe it's better to say it's described again in what John sees. One day it will find its literal uh, fulfillment and realization uh, here among the kingdoms of man. Now, we said last time that in, uh, I believe we said last time, uh, yeah, we must have, right? Because we were, we were speaking in our last episode uh, about the connection between Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2. And we spoke about Daniel chapter 2 as setting up this discussion this time. Well, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream recorded in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar basically sees the same, uh, gets the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's vision is the same, although the imagery is different. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, again, there was a statue uh, comprised of various metals of diminishing value from head to toe, ultimately starting with gold, but finishing with this, uh, these iron uh, legs and feet, uh, iron uh, legs and feet, and, and the feet, the toes of the feet were mixed with, uh, iron mixed with clay. And then this last uh, empire that is represented by those uh, feet and toes and such uh, ultimately is smashed, crushed, brought down. Uh, and, and you know, I imagine the vision, what Daniel sees is this whole thing toppling down uh, as this mountain cut without hands strikes at the feet. And so the, the, me the meaning of that, as Daniel explains it to Nebuchadnezzar, is that he is the head of gold. His kingdom will be followed by another, uh, the Medo-Persian, then followed by another, the Greeks, and then followed by another, the Romans. And then ultimately the feet with the toes, uh, 10 toes of iron mixed with clay, are, are intended to symbolize a revived version of that kingdom that they're attached to or the Roman Empire. And so Daniel now in chapter seven sees a, that's probably the shortest I've ever given to that description, by the way. So anyway, in Daniel chapter seven, he sees what essentially amounts to the same vision, except rather than toes, he sees horns. Uh, the number of heads, interestingly, lines up exactly the same. Uh, we see seven heads and 10 horns in Revelation 13. When you add up from these four beasts, the number of heads you get seven. There are four beasts. The third beast has four heads. Each of the others has one. So there is even in that we see a connection between these two visions uh, speaking of the same thing. Okay. Now, interestingly, Daniel sees beasts, 
John sees beasts. We said last time when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, the image represented sort of man's perspective on these kingdoms. From Nebuchadnezzar's uh, perspective, and, and arguably from heavens as well, um, each of these kingdoms was less and less impressive as it went on. Um, from man's perspective. Uh, Daniel's vision here is truly from heaven's perspective. Rather than seeing shiny metals that represent sort of glorious kinds of kingdoms of men, instead these kingdoms of men are seen as these ravenous beasts, these odd, strange creatures and such. And so, uh, and ultimately, um, as the vision goes on in Daniel chapter 7, we'll see here in verses 9 and 10, uh, also um, uh, 13, 14, and then ultimately we see 23 through 27, we see the description of the kingdom, the mountain cut without hands, or uh, in, in, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, or in Daniel's vision, the coming of the ancient of days to establish his kingdom with thrones and this kind of thing, or in John's vision, we see the establishing of the millennial kingdom with Christ's return. And so each of these pictures is telling essentially the same story, but from different vantage points, and with varying amounts of information given in each. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 fills in a lot of blanks that Nebuchadnezzar, ne Nebuchadnezzar does not see in his dream, but John also includes additional information that Daniel doesn't see in his dream. John, for example, introduces a second beast, a false prophet. Uh, John introduces under the, uh, the, the, um, the reign of Antichrist and the false prophet, the first and second beast as they're referred to. John also includes the, the information about the mark of the beast, um, the idea of, of, of the buying and selling, uh, the, the necessity of the mark of the beast for the buying and selling and those kinds of things. So as the revelation continues through the corridor of time, God gives additional information. And of course, there's other information we could learn from Isaiah and Zechariah and, and, and places like this that help to round out the picture even more. So um, that being said, um, in, in, and we're going to go back to Revelation 13 now, um, but in Daniel chapter 7, my, uh, you know, quote unquote homework for you um, after, uh, you know, when you have time is to read Daniel chapter 7 and, and Revelation 13. Read them side by side. Read them back to back. Uh, read either one that you like first. I would say Daniel 7 first and then go back and read Revelation 13 again because in doing so, you'll begin to see now the connection between these passages and how they ultimately are intended to be seen as speaking of the same thing. But in Revelation 13, we read verse up to verses 10, verse 10 and you'll notice a number of things. First off, um, there is this last beast uh, that is, uh, or in Daniel, there are succeeding beasts, but in Revelation, there's this description um, the beast seems to encapsulate characteristics from each of the previous beasts that are mentioned. And I'm realizing I've got this glare on my glasses. I've got this light here that helps to sort of balance stuff. And it's coming through, unfortunately. Apologize for that. I'm not very professional at this, so we're working on it. But um, so if it distracts, I apologize for that. But in Revelation 13, the beast in view seems to be sort of the culmination of all of those beasts that have come before, or he has in some way characteristics that were true of all of these other beasts, and it's sort of wrapped up in one. Or it may indicate that these previous kingdoms have also been the work of Satan, trying to develop a global world kingdom that ultimately now under the beast, Antichrist, is, is finally realized. He finally gets uh, this to where he wants it to be. Uh, so there's a number of ways that we can see them. All of them are probably somewhat true. Each of these possibilities has some weight to it. But the, you'll notice the Antichrist here, after it is he is described by uh, virtue of, uh, of, of sort of encapsulating these other beasts, we're also brought uh, uh, the information that is, it is the dragon or Satan who's empowering him. And the dragon gives him power to do some pretty amazing things. He has tremendous miraculous kinds of power. Uh, it's important for us to recognize that as secular as this world is moving with the science sort of being the new god of, of, the, uh, you know, of the unbelieving world out there, um, at the end of the day, the irony in this is that Antichrist is going to be, you know, in many respects, uh, one who satisfies the secular desire for, you know, sort of the self-realization of the deity of man kind of a thing. But along with that, he's also going to be a very spiritual person. He's going to declare himself to be God. He's going to demand to be worshipped and that kind of thing. It's an interesting thing. Well, when 
when he takes power as Antichrist, after he goes into the temple, uh, which is described uh, throughout this chapter and again in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he declares himself to be God and demands to be worshipped somewhere, just pr- I imagine just prior to that, one of the things that elevates him and catapults him to the kind of popularity on the global scene that he'll have is the fact that some kind of an assassination attempt apparently is made on him. This is described in chapter uh, three, in, in chapter 13, verse 3 uh, and 4, and also in places like Zechariah chapter 11, where it describes uh, the injury that he sustains uh, as, as affecting his eye and his right arm. Uh, he seems to lose the ability to use these, but he resurrects from this attempt. You'll notice here it speaks of a mortal wound to one of his heads. Um, and But yet he revives, and everybody around the world begins to worship him, all of those, that is, whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so believers who are alive at that time, those who have come to faith after the rapture, who are now enduring this period of tribulation, uh, will see him, but they will not worship him. And they will not go on, as it says later in chapter 13, to take his mark and such. We'll talk about those things next time. But he resurrects from the dead. There is some debate as to whether uh, it is an actual resurrection from the dead or if it appears that he died and rose from the dead. I, I'm actually comfortable with either one of those. I know there's a bit of a, uh, there's a tendency to think, well, Satan can't do that kind of a miracle. Uh, and that may be true, but I don't really know that. You know, uh, it's, it's, that he might have the power to reanimate somebody. I don't know. I don't know exactly. But and it may very well be that the first time we really see that happen is here because the kinds of wonders and signs he does, as Jesus would describe, were poss- would possibly deceive even the very elect. And so it's going to be an incredibly powerful deception uh, when the Antichrist comes on the scene and ultimately uh, rises from the dead after this, uh, this attempt on his life. Uh, but the, the point I'll end on today in that regard is the worship element of it, because this will connect us with our next study as we look at the false prophet in connection with Antichrist and what, is, what ultimately comes on the world scene during that period of time. So the world, after seeing the Antichrist killed, seeing him come back from the dead, they are absolutely blown away and they worship him and they say, who is like him? Who can make war with this one? It's an interesting expression to make. You know, if he's already pretty much uh, a global leader, it may very well be that this sentiment sort of is the rallying cry around him ascending to full power over the global community. But there may be more to it. And I think there tends to be. Um, When Christ comes, And this is a brief synopsis that we'll probably mention again. Uh, Again, a lot of the things we're talking about today are things that have found themselves sprinkled in previous episodes and that kind of thing. So you'll hear common threads as we go through our prophecy updates. Um, But I think that um, when, when Christ returns and Antichrist actually is able to rally the world behind him to try to stop Christ at his return, um... That, you know, as I always say, that takes a particular kind of bravado. That takes a particular kind of arrogance. But that's, the world will be convinced that they can take him on, and it may very well be because who is like the beast and who can make war with him? They may actually think they've got their one who will finally separate them from the tyranny of this, of this God of, of, of the Christians or this purported God of creation and this kind of thing. Uh, it's interesting that the third angel who comes with the everlasting gospel, um, or uh, the first uh, angel who comes with the everlasting gospel comes and, or is it, gosh, I, got, I think I got them backwards, but uh, the three angels that come through uh, earlier in the book, one of them comes with the everlasting gospel. And it revolves around the idea of, of calling people to come and, and put their trust in or to believe in the God of creation. Uh, and so that, uh, uh, that, that may be part of you know, how the thinking of the, the worldview of those in those last days who are outside of the faith ultimately is cultivated to develop a sense of animosity toward the true God and the actual arrogance in believing they can stop uh, his purposes and plans as they unfold in Christ's return. So, all right, well, we're going to go ahead and stop there for today. And we'll pick up here in uh, Revelation 13 next time, uh, looking at verse 11 on through the end of the chapter. And, uh, and we'll continue to make our way through in our look at Antichrist in the Uh, in our study on eschatology. So 
Uh, as always, I so appreciate you watching and listening. It's uh, it's good for us to be going through the Word of God together, especially in these days. I'll tell you what, um, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I'm, I'm expecting Christ to snatch us away any minute. And so uh, to spend time going through the Word of God uh, in between now and then, to me, is a particular blessing, and I'm glad we can share it together. So thanks for coming along and, 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 uh, and, um, and, and checking these uh, videos out. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you give us. Uh, Lord, I... I I'm so grateful, I know we all are grateful for the grace that you've shown us. The fact that you've taken our feet out of the miry clay and you've set them on a rock. We no longer are on the broad road that leads to destruction as your children, but now we are on the narrow road that leads to everlasting life. And it's a road that leads us through many trials, troubles, uh, toils and snares and such, Father. But nonetheless, we go through them knowing that we, though we face tribulation in this world, we can be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome it. And one day he will fully uh, inherit, take possession of uh, all that is rightfully his, all because of what he accomplished at the cross where he defeated sin and death and ultimately has redeemed and saved us. So Father, we pray for those who are lost in these days, who are uh, going to enter into the period of time we're reading about and discussing. Uh, Father, this will be a very, very difficult time and some will be embittered by it and curse uh, the God of heaven and. Uh, we'll resist and even uh, blaspheme you in that. But Father, we pray for as many as will be saved during that period of time. Uh, Father, we know that your work of calling people to, to redemption, even, even as Babylon falls in the later chapters of, of Revelation, you are calling them, uh, you're calling your people to come out of her in this kind of thing, Father. So we, we know your desire uh, is to watch over and protect your children. We know your desire is to see men saved. And we pray that, Father, you'd accomplish those purposes, both in the time that we're here working uh, in those purposes and even after Jesus comes to snatch us away. Thank you, Father, for your great love, your great mercy, and your abundant grace. Thank you, Lord, so much for these things. And we pray that you continue to help us understand your word as we continue to go through it together. In Jesus' name, amen.